Okay, so this is the third meeting of the Hasidut class, and uh, I hope that everybody um, is healthy and your families are healthy, um, and you're able to focus on your studies. Uh, I think we're all in a particular situation. So, is, um, uh, were there any questions from last time that were picked up? Uh, we sort of didn't get a chance to do the Chernobler, the Maori Nine, which will spend time this time because I, in addition to what I'm talking about, I want you to be able to hear the language of the text and how that text um, uh, moves and develops. So I will spend a little bit more time today after some opening remarks, um, reading a number of texts that you might have already seen uh, in uh, green or the others uh, in English, but I do want to go back over them so you can feel the uh, granularity uh, of the text. I think, Ellie, do you have, is that your hand up? No, I think it just is there. Okay. So- um, Can you I, hear me, Professor? Oh, I can hear you now, okay. This is Ellie. Um, I was curious if you can give a little overview of like the evolution of the study of Hasidism from the academy, going back from Shalom to now. Um, So, well, I, I, let, me, let me just um, say it in a, very briefly. I, I saw quickly that you were hitting on some of that in your response paper, but I don't want to overly focus okay. on that. I think that um, among, among the issues that, that we often trace the history of the study of the academic study of Hasidism uh, were um, a whole series uh, of topics um, that were of concern at different times. So um, uh, at the very, uh, sort of near the beginning, there was a, a very um, particular concern to study about the relationship between uh, the Hasidim and the, uh, the rebellion or the social rebellion or the cultural rebellion against the yeshiva world. Um, that was one particular focus to see it from a certain sociological uh, perspective um, the changing perspective towards, uh, towards study, uh, towards community. Um, people, uh, people like Ettinger in Israel focus very much on social economic issues. Um, when I was uh, quite young, I think part of the issue was to see it in, um, in, uh, in, in, in there was an issue to see it in Marxist historical terms, in terms of the, the poverty um, that was taking place. Some of us seeing it in terms of the kind of the transformation of messianic movements. Um, gradually, as I indicated towards um, towards the end of last time, there was a um, uh, a debate, particularly played out between Sholem uh, and Buber, as to whether the drashot or the uh, the uh, texts themselves um, should be understood. Uh, as the core of understanding Hasidism, or whether one should look at the narratives uh, uh, and the uh, the masiyot or the um, or the ver various tales, um, some of these um, uh, 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 reflect difference in class. So the issue of the for the um, for the um, uh, homiletic teachings were often for the elite people, many of whom had a very strong rabbinic background or had gone through the whole Kabbalistic uh, training uh, and were in a process uh, of um, realizing the transformation of the movement. The, the issue for the narratives was much more of a popularization uh, for people who were um, sort of trying to join the movement. So there were a series of uh, discussions, whether it's for the elite uh, or for the common person, uh, how, uh, what, where the emphasis uh, should lie, whether it should be social or personal. Um, these were a whole series uh, of concerns. And then uh, a number of people tried to talk about uh, influences, uh, whether the influence came through a medieval um, Kabbalah or the influences were coming through a kind of uh, failed uh, messianic movements. Um, or whether even in fact uh, some of the influences were due to kind of um, Russian, uh, Russian orthodoxy. Uh, some people have even shown that the, the rise of certain kind of um, um, practices within early Hasidism were very much influenced by uh, what was called in uh, Ukrainian literature or the Russian literature, uh, 
a staritz was a kind of a holy person who would wander the countryside and have mystical experiences. So there was a whole um, academic range um, uh, and um, uh, a lot of this also depended on the degree to which the history of religion was incorporated or people wanted to see it uh, from inside um, rabbinic uh, and cultural language. So I'm going to, I don't want to spend too much time on that issue and I'd like to see it emerge as we do, go from topic to topic. So if you'll excuse me on that, Ellie, I'm going to uh, move uh, uh, to, the, to the issue I wanted to focus on. So when we're talking about a spiritual revolution, which is uh, the sort of the topic uh, of today's uh, discussion, uh, we want to kind of uh, ask ourselves, how did uh, the movement arise? How did it coalesce? And how can we understand uh, this kind of recentering of priorities? So that's part of what I'm really concerned about, and I've alluded to it in other classes. Um, but this recentering is uh, very much related to what Nietzsche would have called the transvaluation of values. That is to say, many of the um, traditions that are coming down are now uh, given the, the language of interpretation is changing. That is to say, there's a new style of reading scripture um, as a way of penetrating the inner life uh, and one's spiritual growth and how one would mark the changes of one's inner life. So a particular form of ecstatic interpretation uh, or a particular form of deliberate interpretation of the scripture um, comes along um, with the refounding of a movement. How do you reattach yourself to the earlier stages of the tradition, to the Bible, to rabbinic literature, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, including the Talmud and the Midrash? In many cases, the medieval commentators are being cited uh, and revised, and in, a, and, a, and in a number of places, particularly uh, in Lithuania, uh, Maimonides is being cited and reinterpreted or culled for specific purposes. So there's a new style of interpretation um, that may have had some antecedents, but now there's a new coordinated effort to focus on that particular style of interpretation around a particular teacher. So as with the growth of many spiritual movements, and we can already see this even from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, these kind of schismatic or break-off movements um, we, uh, will join around a person who is considered to be an authoritative teacher of scripture, right? Um, I'm just gonna let a couple more people in. So the, uh, the issue is who would be uh, an authoritative teacher? and who is going to join that person uh, to be the authoritative teacher. And that that would begin to constitute the cluster. So the way the people would understand Torah, the way they would reinterpret practice. Uh, uh, halachic practice was, was absolutely central, but it will see, as we'll see, it had to make way for particular illumination or ecstatic experiences, which were personal. So this balance between the individual and the group, how does the group maintain um, its uh, centrality as a corporate entity that's part of the community of Israel and the whole practice of the study uh, of, uh, of scripture and Talmud uh, and tradition, and yet also give space for private spiritual experiences uh, as well as collective ecstatic and group experiences. So there's going to be a new hermeneutic, which has antecedents, but then becomes a dominant hermeneutic in certain circles. And within Hasidism, there's an overall trend towards the spiritualization and personalization of the text. But each master had his own style of emphasis and his, uh, his own way uh, of articulating the core message uh, of the spiritual structure of Judaism. Then, um, as we'll see in a moment, there's a whole, the whole issue of vocabulary. All the key theological terms that are coming down uh, will be reinterpreted or they'll be applied 
in slightly different ways, or its place in the hierarchy uh, will be uh, uh, noticed. Uh, who is going to be the leader and why? Uh, will the leader simply be based on learning? Is the leader based on some kind of ecstatic expression of the tradition? Um, or is the leader gonna be based on some kind of principle of succession? Um, who is, how is the movement going to continue? Uh, is it going to continue because new leaders arise and you're going to go from city to city to find a person who really speaks your specific, uh, towards your specific spiritual issues? Um, or do you get attached to a particular dynasty that's gonna be passed down um, in a kind of royal um, uh, dynastic uh, form? Uh, this change in different kinds of groups. And then what would be the particular ideals, right? How do the ideals uh, particularly change? So let me just run through a couple of the issues that we've uh, already begun to see. Um, and uh, then I want to uh, talk to you about uh, um, this, uh, the core, some of the core issues that, that Arthur Green mentioned, but I want to go into them in a slightly different uh, way. So the first thing, of course, is the place of Torah learning. What will be the place of Torah learning uh, in a community that um, uh, where the whole education is a hierarchy of learning coming up from scripture through the rabbinic tradition, the medieval tradition? Um, is learning itself a spiritual practice that is ideal on its own terms, in its own elect, uh, intellectual terms, or as a spiritual practice. Now, there were many Hasidic rebbes who were extraordinarily learned, even around the students of the Magid. Levi Yitzchak of Verdichev was an extraordinarily learned uh, scholar. Uh, so was uh, the, uh, the Gera Rebbe, Ari Yehuda uh, Lev, uh, uh, of Ger. Uh, and read com wrote commentaries uh, on the on the Talmud, uh, and the Kotzka Rebbe uh, turned the study of Talmud into a spiritual practice. But one of the overall characteristics of the movement um, is that the study of the Talmudic uh, text is now being displaced uh, by um, more personal uh, readings of shorter passages. Uh, passages of scripture, passages of, of the Midrash, and uh, engaging in the full volume of rabbinic literature is not considered to be um, the ideal that would get you into a spiritual place. In fact, it's quite interesting that uh, in many Hasidic sources, uh, we even see that when if a person was focusing on the Talmudic source, they would often indicate that a person should take time off and take a spiritual pause and begin to meditate um, uh, so that one can uh, begin to uh, 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 reforge a spiritual bond with God that might have been lost uh, when one was simply uh, studying uh, the academic study of the Talmud. So there's a shift from the elite study of an elite literature, which is the Talmudic dialectics, to a uh, personal study or simply people hearing it orally. Uh, many people were not educated and there wasn't a downplaying of their spiritual potential, but they would be receiving a Torah. The Torah now is the verbal teaching of a master and it comes in through the ear, not necessarily through the eye. And it may come in not as a singular act of study or with a study partner, but it would come through a kind of group uh, meal or group dancing or group singing um, or shared ecstatic practice. In other words, there's a kind of aspect in which the spiritual uh, qualities are received through a kind of osmosis, um, internalized, uh, picked up by the ear, picked up by the body, through gestures, and not simply as a uh, intellectual elite uh, quality. Because there is this new emphasis on inner 
spiritual readiness and preparation. So this notion of readiness and preparation called hachana, preparation, means that you may need more time to become ready to begin your spiritual practice. Now Judaism, or classical rabbinic Judaism, is very much focused around the issue um, of fixed times, fixed measures of time, fixed times when, when you can begin a certain cycle of prayers, up until what time, when that time would be broken. And that had great authority from very early periods of time on. That is to say, this notion of what's called in Hebrew, the zmanim, the particular time, the time settings of prayer. But there were many uh, Hasidim at the very beginning, and this continues as a practice even in many groups, who would ignore the time periods because they felt that they weren't spiritually attuned or ready to begin the process of prayer. And this was one of the reasons that led to an enormous backlash by the Lithuanian Talmudic uh, um, uh, academies. Not only were they not following a, a Rav or a rabbinic authority, um, and they weren't studying Talmud and all the Talmudic commentaries uh, throughout the Middle Ages, um, but they were also ignoring the fixed body of halachic rules of when you could begin a prayer service and when you would end the prayer service because the focus is on inner illumination and inner uh, preparation. So this issue of zmanim um, changes as a, uh, as a priority. Another term that many of you have probably have heard is the, the notion of tikkun. You think of tikkun olam, the reparation of the world. Well, in the early Kabbalistic framework, the tikkun is a tikkun of something within the hierarchy of God. As, as radical and as grandiose as that would sound, um, the mentalization in prayer, which would be called a kavana, a focusing in prayer, would be on a specific dimension in the Godhead to repair something that might have been ruptured, uh, presumably through um, sin uh, uh, by, by individuals or the group. Um, this aspect is totally refocused, not from the repair or the tikkun of something in the absolute hierarchy of God, but through one's inner psychological structure, right? So there's, again, this transvaluation. The word tikkun stays, but it's now focused more on the inner life of the spiritual seeker or the adept or the person who becomes a chaver, who becomes a member of the particular group. A chaver not simply being a tal as one who studies the Talmud, but a person who is a member of the group. So the ideal of what's called dibuk chaverim, this kind of collectivity of friendship is part of a social network and not simply uh, pairing off with a person who has a uh, specific hierarchy uh, of, of knowledge. So there's that, and we're gonna take a look at uh, a kavana. So, let, so one of the uh, issues that um, would be focused on is if the kavana is not directed to the higher, to the higher spheres, to something uh, we might say in the Godhead or in the supernal uh, or uh, ontological realms, um, but something that would engage you uh, more spiritually, the focus of prayer and the focus of intention changes. So it's no longer an intentional focus to repair a certain modality, as it were, within the divine life uh, uh, that, uh, that is beyond understanding and thought, but is to uh, refocus one's attentiveness to certain ideals, okay? Uh, and one of the uh, chief ideals was to focus on the allness or totality of God that God is the total reality 
um, both in this world and beyond this world. So the phrase that appears from Isaiah 6, that God's kavod, God's imminent glory, fills the entire uh, world, and that has to be a focus of consciousness. So I want to um, uh, go back over, and um, uh, I'll be translating from the Hebrew text, but it's one of the texts that uh, Green gives um, uh, in, his, um, in, his, uh, in his essay. Uh, it's, the te- it's a text from the Magid, from something called the Likutim uh, Yekarim. Um, and um, Green discusses this, I think, uh, somewhere around page 117 and following, if you're going to look at the English. But I want to kind of read it more, more concretely so that you can see what a meditation in relationship to prayer is going to be. Because in all these cases, there's this transvaluation of the values which now begins to create a new community of purpose that each individual will do on their own, but the collectivity will join together uh, in this way. So it's from the Likutim Yikarim, which is a collection of the sacred teachings of the Magid. Um, It's from uh, paragraph 161 that Green quotes. And now I'm going to kind of translate it fairly literally. And I want to set the background. So at least twice a day, and there are other times it could be done, um, the, the Jewish worshiper is to recite the Shema prayer from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And there were many meditations of how you get your mind to think about oneness and that the mind would open up from the focus on the one to a full awareness of the oneness, right? And that one would do this as a meditative exercise while reciting the scripture as a spiritual practice, okay? So um, the Magid begins to say, the kavana of echad, the kavana on the word echad, right? Um, and that the word echad, um, uh, stands uh, for for thirteen, which already uh, in, is numerically uh, thirteen, um, and that already alludes for a kabbalist to the enumeration of the divine name. So, by focusing on the one, one is focusing on the divine, the tetragram, the divine name that fills all of being. All right, that's already hinted at, coded into the letters of Echad, which numerically come out to 13, is already a, has, has, the, has the code of the divine name. So he says that the Kavanah... Professor, what page are we on in Arthur Green's book? I think it's 117 and following. Uh, if you want me to take a look at that, I'll find that. And then you can say 117. Let me just see. 117 is about the generations of uh, um, Isaac... Yeah, it's on 117, on 117 if you have that. Okay, the proper intention. So the way, uh, so the way uh, the Magi is saying that the, and and follow my reading of the, even if you're looking at that so you can feel it, the Kavana, so he's saying, he's now being a teacher. The teacher is giving a teaching for spiritual intention in which the Kavana now is a totally refocusing on that word it's an intentionality which is going to focus on one's personal consciousness and religious consciousness as an individual in relationship to the totality of God and not focusing on the supernal realm where one is repairing this or that breach that might have happened. So the kavana of echad, of the word echad, which is the last word, here always with the God of God, the Lord is one, echad. He's now going to say of the yichud, of the recitation of the Shema, when one is to focus on the uniqueness of God. So now the uniqueness of God is understood to be the absolute totality of the oneness of God. One should have the intention that there is nothing, aim, there is nothing else, nothing else in all the worlds except the Holy One, blessed be He. Okay? That should be the mental state of the worshiper as one works through the language of that recitation. So it's not just 
re reciting something and fulfilling one's obligation simply by reciting the words, but by moving spiritually through the letters to come out to the quality of echad in one's consciousness. Whose glory fills all of being. Now, obviously, this is going to be related to what we talked earlier about the notion of panentheism, right? So God fills all of existence, but all of existence is not in God. God transcends. So there is a balance between God's imminent totality, um, which totally surrounds the worshiper, um, and, uh, it, and that this consciousness should um, be saturated with the notion of oneness. What, um, uh, and now he's going to go a little bit deeper. Um, and the essence of this, I don't, I'm not looking at Green's thing, so you can correct me if he has a different thing. The essence, the ikar, the, the main pivot of this kavana is that a person should make himself or herself as nothing, as, as, as nothing, okay? Now notice already what's happening in this particular statement. A person should regard themselves, yasimetatsmo, so that's a mental form of mindfulness, that you think of yourself as ayin ve'efes, but if you think of yourself as ayin, as nothing, you are now linking up to that notion we saw in the preceding paragraph, that you should think that there is nothing, ayin, there's nothing but God, okay? So there's already this imitatio dei, or that the self um, enters into that nothing, um, but has to be done through an act of self-conscious intention. Okay, that's the paradox, obviously. The, and, and, this, and the essence is only that one's soul, one's neshama, one's highest spiritual state, is chelek eloka mimao, is part of God, God's self. Notice the radicality of this. Now, this language is much earlier. Uh, it appears different ways, but now it's understood in a radical sense that a person is a portion of God on high. In other words, that the individual soul, to the degree to which it can be individuated or become conscious, is a coming conscious of something within the divine totality. And the result is that there is nothing, ain again, in all the worlds except the Holy One, blessed be He, who is one. And now the final paragraph. And the further essence of this kavana to, of oneness, that one should think that all of the world is filled with God's glory. And there is nothing panui mimenu. There's nothing but God. Okay? So God is all. There's nothing but God. One is part of God. And yet one also has a differentiated consciousness uh, to make that consciousness real. Okay, this is a, a very old paradox for Eastern and Western religions, um, how that the self can nullify the self and also uh, come back to itself through a form of awareness. But the task of the person is to become like God, as it were, through a spiritual act of self-nullification of selfhood as an independent entity. And that that, and that that is the core of that recitation, okay? So being part of that essential core of that recitation is now transvaluating the whole structure of prayer. Prayer now is a process of inner focusing and inner transformation. It's not simply the recitation of the words. It's not simply fulfilling the law of the words, but being brought into a certain state of presence in which self-presence 
is absorbed in consciousness, right? So there is a, there is, as it were, a, a trace of consciousness that can be aware of this. Two more people coming in, I'm just sorry. So there's a trace of consciousness that's aware of that, but it's like a kind of oil slick, it's a film underneath the inner nature of the self, right? That is aware, but not aware. That is self, but not self. That is God, but also self, okay? So this paradox and this transvaluation of values of what imminence means, what it means to say one, what it means to say that there's nothing but God and that to place oneself in this is part of the task of worship. So you can already begin to see there's a tension between the normative structure of prayer, which is required, and the whole process of recitation, which is really more of a mental mantra that would be done. And in other sources, it, it's accompanied by certain breathing techniques, certain other levels of awareness as one goes through those six letters um, of that particular recitation. Now, what that essentially means is that there's a tension the, the difference between self and God in normal theism is now placed in a certain spiritual problematic, right? There is self and other, because God is the total other, but one is oneself as a spiritual soul that is aware of an attempt to try at least momentarily to enter into this higher level uh, of consciousness, all right? So that awareness becomes a spiritual ideal that you would carry with you into the street, into your dealing with every person. So we, I had mentioned the phrase, for example, uh, from Proverbs 3, which says, you shall know God, da'ehu, Behold right? Uh, in all your ways, da'ehu, you have to know God. Now, this is a, a phrase that already appears in the Talmud, in the sec section on brachot very early. And the statement um, is very clear that you could fulfill knowing God by the study of Talmudic um, legal halacha, like nizikin, the laws of damages and torts. Okay? Now, throughout the Middle Ages, various moralists and teachers, let us say Rabbeinu Yonah, who was in the 13th century, he was a nephew of Nachmanides, also gave certain kind of spiritual emphasis on this. But all, now in the 18th century, this becomes a recentering ideal. It's a recentering ideal for everyone that you should know God in everything that you do, in every way that you're acting. Because everything and everybody has a divine dimension. So you're living with this notion that everything, everything you're doing, all the forms of practice, including worshiping, ac uh, uh, celebrating God's presence to one's daily activity. Um, so there is nothing separate from the worship of God because one is to a certain degree not separate. That separateness is really a sign um, that you have work to do in your consciousness, all right? So that aspect of total awareness would mean at another level that one could have an immediate attachment to God. This became another way in which the hierarchy of the revolution would be reconfigured. Let me give you an example. So if you're reading Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy 10 from, will be saying that one of the things you have to do is to obey God, obey God's word, fear God, have love of God, and uledav kabo, and then you should cleave to him. In other words, you, you perform the commandments, you observe the commandments, you have fear and love, 
and then you cleave to God as an attachment of spiritual connection. Now, even Kabbalists like Nachmanides in the 13th century, when they're writing a popular commentary, see that sequence as a de developmental sequence. And most of the history of Judaism saw that as a developmental sequence. You have to begin by observance, right? You begin by a certain form of observance, attentiveness to the law. You cultivate a certain kind of spiritual con connection through love and to fear. And at the highest level, if you're fortunate, there may be a momentary link and connection to God. Hasidism, and, the revel and one of the things that the Baal Shem Tov says in some of the early texts, is that you can pogo into devekut, into connection, immediately. Simply by having the right intention, even without going through those stages, one could be immediately attached to God. Now you can see the revolutionary positive and negative aspect of that, in a very fixed hierarchical culture where the concern is not to pogo over the whole rabbinic tradition into a state of spiritual connection, but one uh, has to get to go through the hierarchy at certain levels. Now, if you're at that level, you become aware that there's no separation between yourself and God and that that separation is a feature of your lower mind, right? That you're focusing on everyday matters. So Green, um, in the text that he cites from Ben Porat Yosef, which is in Green, um, just finding it in my text here, um, on uh, 107, the famous parable about the Baal Shem, which I will go into, and I, if you looked at it, you go back and see it. As I'm gonna, I want to, I want to go through the Hebrew with you. So, the uh, the the teaching of uh, of the Ben Porat Yosef of Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya, who is a great scholar, often cites many teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. And one of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov that he's going to bring down is this immediate awareness that one is in immediate contact with God and the exterior world is a function of maya or illusion. And that you have to clear your mind of these representations of the world, which are there, but, not, but you have to see them as the spiritual configurations in nature, which they are, okay? Now, I wanna just say a word of prologue before I, I read and translate this section from the Ben Porat Yosef, and that's as follows. And I think it, it would be something that you might wanna do on your own, to, again, to see the re and revolution that's taking place. So one of the most famous parables in medieval Jewish philosophy, and probably influenced Kafka as well, is the famous parable um, in Book 3, Chapter 51, at the end of the Guide of the Perplexed by Maimonides. Right? And it's leading up to his own meditative connection with God. And he establishes a parable of the palace and the king in the palace. We won't go through all of the levels, but for Maimonides, the average worshiper, the common person with even out uh, with very little knowledge or even who has a normative rabbinic training, is simply a wanderer around the palace, can't ascend or go into the core of the palace, just wanders around the ramparts, can't get in. And as that person accedes to certain forms of philosophical wisdom and becomes less than just a common person, but begins to make a difference between appearance and reality, 
between philosophical truth and opinion, say in the Platonic or the Aristotelian sense, you move gradually into the palace. And that's a process of intellectual spiritual development, right? This is what um, uh, Spinoza said in Latin is amor dei intellectualis, a spiritual love of God, intellectual love of God. The more you love God, the more you're attracted by the spiritual focus and you move in until your mind becomes attached to the mind of God, okay? And um, there are other practices that Maimonides talks about, but essentially this is an elite practice where a person who simply observes the law is also way out doesn't even have, begin to have understanding. Then you have to begin to know about allegory, about spiritual allegory, about intellectual forms, about appearance and reality, what's true, about the meaning of philosophy. Um, and ultimately, your mind is purified and focused through the dialectics of philosophy. He uses the dialectics of the Talmud as a spiritual philosophical exercise to clear your mind so it becomes only a logical apparatus. And ultimately when the mind is cleared and can hone in on dialectical focus, uh, it may come to the notion of the oneness of God and that unity, okay? Now, intentionally or not, uh, the Baal Shem uses a parable of the palace. And the parable of the palace is related to what in Eastern religion you call Maya. Is there a difference between myself and the physical world? And is the, if the physical world is an expression of God's truth, there is no distinction. It's only a mental process. Now, so I want to uh, just read part of the text uh, as I'm going to be translating it, if you have the green text, you can be looking at that. He goes and says as follows. Um, so he's now going to teach something, Sheshamati, that I heard from my master. Again, this notion, my master is a spiritual master, right? That I heard from my master, who is the Baal Shem Tov. Um, and he says, a mashal. This is going to be a parable that he taught before the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, okay? Which would be, in a sense, uh, there are many intentions about the shofar. And one of the intentions of the shofar is how it may break open consciousness to a spiritual awareness. And so, obviously, he's concerned now with the teaching of what would it mean not just to hear the shofar blast, not simply to be called back into repentance, but to have one's mind broken open so that one is in immediate presence of God. So he goes on and he says that there was once a king, a wise king, um, and uh, what he did is that he, uh, made a, uh, a, uh, he made a palace. Right, and the palace that he had, um, and he saw, he, uh, and he, 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 he made this palace, that, which was in fact an achizat enayim. It was an illusion. Right, he was a kind of cosmic magician who was able to create a palace that was an illusion, that appeared to be real on the appearance level, but in terms of reality, had no substance. Okay. And he built around it uh, walls, ramparts, and turrets, and various kinds of gates. And he commanded people that they should come through the gates to see him and go through the ramparts. And in order to entice them, it says, he scattered gold coins all around the gates. And he said, if you come through this, you will receive a great reward all this kind of material reward, this thing to come to see the king, all that would separate them from a kind of a spiritual thing. 
And then it says, um, so then the king commanded various people to go through, and one person after another tried to come in and failed, and was obviously trapped by the materiality that was around the various gates. And then it says that he had a son, presumably this being Israel, he had a son, the dearly beloved son, who desired to be with the father, the king, with an extraordinary desire. And with that extraordinary desire, in one fell swoop, he realized that the ramparts and the walls and the turrets and the gates were an illusion and one could be immediately in the presence of God. Devekut, this connection with God, could be immediate with a shift in consciousness. And the shift in consciousness is now not something that is gained through rabbinic wisdom. It's a shift in consciousness through spiritual yearning and desire. A love to be with the Father. So this yearning and this desire for spiritual attachment immediately creates the connection. So here we have, as it were, a counter parable to the parable of Maimonides. And of course, uh, Kafka's parable about the palace and standing by the gate and whether it's opening for you, we can talk about that another time, is a kind of riff on that as well. At a, at a more contemporary form of understanding. And then he goes on to say, which is a section that Green doesn't uh, bring, that I also heard from my master, that if one gets to that place, two things happen. And he's now quoting from the Sabbath Psalm, Psalm 92, that all the enemies will be dispersed. That is to say the poale oven which are the mind games that a person has, will be dispersed. Yitpadadu kol poale oven. As soon as your mind, as soon as your mind is focused on that desire, that you're pulled ahead. In other words, spiritual desire pulls the mind. And as soon as that happens, he says, there are two things that happen. Yitpadadu kol poale oven. It's his reading of Psalm 92 that the workers of iniquity will be dispersed. That is to say, the mind games, or what the Buddhists will call the monkey mind, right? The false thoughts, the machshavot zarot, the things that rise into consciousness because you're not focused, will scatter because they're blocking your vision to the vision that there is nothing else but God, right? So, and then, he says right after that, the other thing that happens, you become aware, malo chal ha'aretz kabodo, that there's nothing but God, right? The thing that we said, God fills the universe, which he had given, we saw earlier as that particular form of a kavana. So already from the very beginning, there's this new hierarchy, inwardness, spiritual desire, and the immediacy of the possibility of connecting with God's, not just presence, but the, the shechina is, if the shechina is the totality of being, there is nothing else, right? So it's not a subject-object connection. It's what we might call an absorption, a totality, so that when the mind pulls back by the tricks that the mind plays, then you, then you feel that there is a distinction. Then there is a distinction between the so-called monkey mind of the poale oven that is playing games with you, and you think that there is a rampart and that there are gates, and you can't come into the king's presence, and you realize that that is illusion, okay? Now, there are many different discussions in Hasidic literature uh, as to what that state of consciousness is, right? Is it real 
uh, from God's side, what is real from God's side, what is real from our side. But from our point of view, we're talking about that all of life now is a spiritual practice. And all of life is trying to get you into a certain state of spiritual consciousness. And the tradition is serving that purpose. It's not simply to express obedience, but it's a dimension that will bring you into immediacy. It's not a subject object immediacy. It's a spiritual awareness. And again, there is there remains, as it were, a awareness of the self being aware that there's nothing but God, right? This is, as I said, this is one of the tricks, the classical paradoxes of all mystical religions and it's in Buddhism, too. how can you be aware that you're nothing, right? But that paradox aside, it's an inescapable paradox, but it becomes the hierarchical ideal and that one, so now it's not something that didn't exist before, but now there's a new emphasis. You can get immediately to God. You can go through the illusions uh, of reality. That devekut is not something that you have to achieve at the end of an elite process of practice. But that doesn't mean that that practice was nullified. I think Green is correct that the fact is that there is a complex balance between the two, okay? And those who are on the inside say that this is not heresy, right? Those who are on the outside say that it's heresy, that's breaking down subject object, that it will lead to nihilism, that will lead to annihilation of religious practice and anarchy, that by not following the strict letter of the law, there's a kind of anomistic um, anomism. But those on the inside will make the counterclaim that the, the purpose of the tradition is to make a person a worshiper. Now, how do you become an Evid Hashem? How do you become a worshiper of God other than trying to place yourself into the most intimate connection with God as possible, okay? So everything is in the service, or some people would call it um, avodat chasidim. It's the spiritual labor of the Hasidic path. Now, I just meant, I, I Green also brings a selection of this letter, um, uh, that uh, from the early generations uh, of uh, Hasidism, from the Chabad Hasidim. Uh, and I want to at least, um, uh, he brings it around page 122, but I want to kind of do a couple of other sections that Green uh, uh, didn't cover, because it's a letter in which people are really trying to convince one another that this is not heresy. It's absolute spiritual truth. So there's a language of the inside. Hasidic literature talks about people who are anshe shlomenu. Anshe shlomenu are people who are part of our fellowship of truth, as opposed to the opponents, the mitnagdim, right? It's interesting that the term mitnagdim, the opponents, or the so-called Lithuanian and those who are antagonistic to this total shift of values were called mitnagdim because they opposed, the earlier use of that term is that people who opposed Shabtai Tzvi and his messianic movement. And the people who were followers of Shabtai Tzvi were called ma'aminim, believers. And the people who rejected that were called mitnagdim. Now that term mitnagdim, the opponents, now shifts to the Hasidim, and many have pointed out the fact that there may have been followers of some of the traditions of this failed messianic movement and some of its more paradoxical practices that entered into Hasidism. I don't want to get into that whole debate in early 
academic study of Hasidism, which is a historical study, there are certain features that do come in. Uh, and it's one of the things that Sholem very much uh, emphasized uh, 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 that, that, that strain that comes in. But the, the point that I want to stress here is that the mitnagdim are again against the Hasidim or those who have a different level of spiritual consciousness, who see the whole purpose of prayer and service to be, to connect to God, to be a part of God who is the totality of all being. Now, I'm not saying that every group had this radical notion, but the circle around the Magid, Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, um, the Shneir Zalman, who is the founder of Chabad, uh, certainly so. And um, I want you to just now hear uh, just another section um, of this letter that, um, that Green quoted in part. So he said, the person is writing, listen, my beloved friend, and then he speaks into English, into Yiddish. Don't say that this is God for fend, heresy and philosophy. He says, that this is apikorsis and philosophia, right? Because the danger is that if it's heresy, you've gone off the deep end uh, to claim that you can be like God. And philosophy would mean that God is simply an allegorical symbol and doesn't have an immediate connection uh, to the world, which is part of the critique uh, of Maimonides in the early days. Rather say that this is a true belief by virtue of which uh, everything can happen. You should believe in the living God. Okay, so this is this notion of Elohim Chayim, which is this core notion in early Hasidism. God is the living God, or the way one of the students of the Magid, they, uh, the, uh, the Rebbe, uh, the Gera Rebbe, uh, uh, Yehuda Arya Leib of Gur, who wrote the Sfat Emet, the teaching of truth, emphasized that the living God injects vitality or the living quality into every existent thing. And the spiritual task is to locate that in everything particularly in one's own soul. Then he goes on to say, and all the Hasidim, all the Hasidim, especially those who follow Shnei Zalman, and that they, uh, that, they, that they come to this notion that there is nothing other than God, particularly when they're reciting the Shema, right? We just saw that, right? Particularly when they're doing that. And then he says the Hasidim have this belief and he says that the opponents, the mitnagdim, they too believe, have a great belief that they're believers, and they believe that God took Israel out of Egypt. But for them, and they also say that everything is possible for God, right? They have emuna, he says, and that they say God can do all things. But we, he said, that alts is God, all is God. Right? So that is this new recentering of consciousness. That God is the all or the transcendent has entered into the imminence so that it's totally suffusing. And it's only the mind that is broken, um, uh, um, uh, breaking out of that. And then he goes on to say that one, ha that one has to deal with this through spiritual focus. He said that some of the students of the Ma'or Naim, he says, Menachem Nachem of Chernobyl students, acted in a wild fashion because of this belief. So he's referring to the fact that the people went into ecstatic frenzies or ecstatic states, something that the Mitnagdim also were opposing. And so he's now saying um, that there also has to be some way that the tradition has to control and channel and balance this radical imminence and connection with God, this Devekut, which now breaks down. It's an unio mystica at the deepest level and that the simplest person can get there um, uh, by, uh, by a kind of intensification uh, uh, of this immediate connection uh, that there is nothing other uh, than God. Um, 
So let's see. Does anybody want to pick up on anything here? Because I want to be mindful of the time and I want to look at one um, text, a couple of texts that Green brings in speaking Torah. And then we'll look for the, the last hour and a half or so at this Me'irat uh, Inayim. So if you take out, um, if you take out your, uh, your text, uh, I want to um, focus on, um, I think it was, was it 118? Or um, the, um, Let's write a quick question. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, um, yeah, uh, on uh, page 116 and 17. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm you mentioned say. earlier you commented regarding the uh, Talmudic dialectic as a sort of spiritual cleansing. I'm just curious, what's what are you citing? Where are you drawing that from? Do you, if you recall exactly what. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, even in the, Maimonides', Maimonides notion that a third of the day, which is studying Talmudic dialectics is to train the mind to think in abstract form so that one begins to abstract the mind from materiality to the underlying spiritual dynamics. That's a process of spiritual practice. Um, uh, the Kotzko Rebbe and other, um, uh, some other Hasidic Rebbe's also focused on the fact that the study of the text um, is a connection to God's will and to uh, and a form of, uh, of purification, okay? So what I want to actually do, let's took to page, um, uh, actually 118 and 119 in the English. Let me just find um, the uh, the Hebrew. So we, uh, we're in the, uh, the um, Here in the text. Uh, 455, I think, right? What? 455. What? 455. Right. Let's, let's find out. 55. 455, I think. 455. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me see. Um, we're looking for the Maori Nayan. So it's not 455. Um, uh, it's the next page. Um, 450, 453. Okay. okay. So the reason I want to choose this, and it's actually, this is a teaching that comes down um, to a variant form already in the Zohar, but it's really there in a much more Kabbalistic setting is related to this issue that is bearing on this revolutionary movement. That is to say, um, one has to find one's spiritual place in the tradition. Okay. So the Baal Shem gave a very famous teaching. It was one of the first teachings actually that Buber translated, but it relates to this notion that one has to find one's own spiritual understanding before one, to, in order to have access to the tradition. So those of you who know the, the, the standard prayer, the Amida, it begins, Eloheinu velohei avoteinu, our God and the God of our fathers. Right? So the Baal Shem, this, we'll see how this links to the, to the Maori Naim. So the Baal Shem Tov taught at the very beginning, you have to first say, Eloheinu, who is our God? You have to find your own spiritual path as a way into the God of the Fathers. Okay. Now, the whole tradition that he is reacting to is that you begin with the Masora and the God of the Fathers, and you begin with the God of tradition, and then you find yourself or you find your own place within that. But the new recentering and the transvaluation of values is to say, you have to, you have to kind of first get your head in a new space to come back to the tradition in a new reinterpretive fashion that we've been talking about, right? 
It's not, you're not against the tradition, but you now have to come to the tradition with a transformed awareness. And that's gonna be one of the issues that is going to be focused on by the Maori Naim. So briefly put, they're going to focus on the wells that Isaac had to re-dig. And the question that was raised already from the 13th century in the Zohar is, but those wells were already dug by the patriarchs and the matriarchs, right? Those wells are there, and those, those spiritual resources were already dug. So why is the Torah telling us to focus on Isaac digging the wells to find water? And it says, because the wells had been stopped up. Those, those are the wells of other people. They were stopped up and they're not giving you nourishment. You have to dig your own well in that same cavern that the ancestors had the well, but you now you have to clean it. Okay? So here again, you see this particular issue that there is the tradition and you come to the tradition, but you have to clean out that traditional well so that it will give you spiritual nourishment and water. Okay? So it's that complex balance, but this new rebalancing that you have an obligation to take care of your spiritual life is what's going on. So now let me, let's just do this text um, uh, and then we'll take a little break and then we'll spend a lot of time on the Maori Naim. So I'm gonna just be translating um, uh, uh, as we go. Uh, so Isaac returned, so he came back to a place and he dug Be'erot Mayim, wells of water, okay? So all the symbolism of the well being a source of sustenance, physical and spiritual sustenance, okay? And the servants of Isaac dug in the valley and they found there Be'er Mayim Chayim, the wells of living waters, okay? It was not just the waters, but living waters, nourishing waters. That was the, the wells of the tradition that the patriarchs had used to draw forth water are still there. They're still the structures of tradition, but the waters have to be replenished and dug anew because, let us say, the language doesn't work. The goal doesn't work. The purpose doesn't work. It's no longer nourishing. Okay, so let's see what he says. So now look at the way he begins. Um, and I'm going to be translating from this way. What, and to, in order to understand this, lahavin, so not, he's not saying, we're not, I'm just not going to explicate. In order to understand the spiritual purpose of why the Torah speaks this way, because the Torah could speak historically, the Torah can speak this way and that way, but why does the Torah have this language? What is its deeper spiritual message? Do you have to understand it? In order to understand this, you have to understand the verse from Jeremiah 2, verse 13. They have abandoned me, who is the source of living water. Okay, so now he's using the tradition to set up the foil, right? Jeremiah, who is uh, many centuries later, and from the seventh cent, middle, uh, early part of the seventh century, 620, uh, from, from 628 or so before the common era. So we're talking about, uh, you know, a good six or 700 years later, but he's now using that text as a spiritual foil. The text can now be taken out of their context and be used for spiritual instruction. So the people have abandoned the source of living waters because God, may he be blessed, is the source from which all the sources and influences of life, for all life in all forms come, ain od milvado, and there's nothing but God, from Deuteronomy 4. So notice how he's already made this shift from, Deut from Jeremiah to now a much larger theological statement, which is going to be his premise. Abandoning God means to abandon the source of life that nourishes everything. It's not just your spiritual life. There is a chiyut, or so God is, when it says that God is the source of life, he's the source of chiyut, that is to say, it's the sustaining force 
by which anything exists. So according to the Hasidim, if you remove anything of God from existence, it wouldn't exist. So even in the lowest realm of evil, there has to be a spark of life or purpose or else it wouldn't exist. And he says, so he's saying, in all the Ophanim, everything, there's nothing but God. So notice now he's bringing in this teaching on passant, he's not, it's not a parable, uh, but he's teaching this as a kind of deep spiritual hermeneutic. And everyone who is connected to it, hadavukbo, so notice, you don't have to, he's not saying that you now have to go through uh, 20 years of Talmudic education, but he says everyone who's attached to it is connected to the Shodesh HaChiyut, which never fails. Okay? So, anyone who's attached to it, V'chol, right? He's not making a distinction of what you have to do to be connected to it. He's not denying that there's a hierarchy of learning, that Judaism couldn't exist without all of its laws and teachings and traditions. But he's saying you can be connected to God through this immediate awareness that God, and then Uvilvad, and, but you should have, and particularly that you should, that it should be no, there is no hafsaka mitzido. From God's side, there is an eternal and perpetual flowing of beneficence and vitality into existence. Or we couldn't talk about existence, right? There is no ceasing of God's livingness. To say God is the living God is that, that there is no ceasing to that livingness. For, he says, for if God forbid, because of our sin or the sins of a person, a person could cause something to be ruptured from this. Yafsik et atzmo mi hamakor yedar chiyutenu chiyuto mimeno. Right? So if from our side, when we are having false thoughts or false actions, we are disrupting the pure flow. We are distorting it. We are causing imbalances. But from God's side, God's, God's chesed, God's grace, is that it's always flowing. You can distort the flow, but it's always flowing. Right? From his side, there's no hefseh. There's no ceasing. You could turn aside. <clears throat> you could do anything you want. You could shut your mind off. You can make idols in your head. You can do all the monkey mind things that we just talked about, right? But if you do that, you're simply blocking or distorting that all ever-flowing divine um, stream. He's using water as a stream of vitality. It's what, whatever causes the sustenance and the existence to be. So light, water, these are all ontological metaphors, right? You can't take them literally but it helps us focus a little bit on that. So he says, because, and now he's quoting from Isaiah 59, it's because of your sins that there's a separation between you and God. Notice now what he's saying here is what I was linking back to when I gave the Baal Shem's parable. The mavdil, the havdil, the separation between you and God is false consciousness or actual sin, right? And that that sets up the moat and the turret and the walls, right? That is the cognitive structures that place us from that true consciousness, according to the Chernobyl Rebbe. And if a person has their vitality from the negative side, right? From, from, from the demonic forces, that is to say, you use the force of life in negative ways, right? So a thief, a crook, a killer um, are also using these forces in distorted ways. So they are trapping and hiding the sources of life. And these are what Jeremiah referred to as the borot nishparim, the fragment, the broken the broken cisterns. Those are the shells. Those are the fragments 
of existence that have to be healed again and brought together because they've been cut off from their higher root. So then he says that the ancestors who opened up these gates, these gates of consciousness in this world, and limdu dat, and taught dat, a spiritual awareness, how how one should do that digging by themselves. They taught that. They didn't just teach where the wells are. They gave examples of the necessity to do that. In order to be divukin, to be connected to that source. So they're saying that each person can find that way to be reconnected. And then they become servants of God and they become followers of Isaac. And their practice is uh, for God alone through the example of the patriarchs. So then he goes on to, uh, to describe how the um, other, how uh, after the death of Abraham, the sources of wisdom were blocked up because of the plishtim. In other words, these false forces had blocked one's access, false learning, false application, false consciousness had blocked these things up. And the everything, the well has now been broken into fragmentation. That's the nishbarim. So the task is to restructure the well so that it's a, a well that can contain the living water. So one's soul is one's well, right? The well isn't something in the field, right? The well is your own being, you might say, right? So here, the spiritual metaphor is whether you want to call the well the seichel, as he says, consciousness, or da'at, a kind of awareness, or you want to actually say that your whole body is a, is a well, How with what is it being filled? How do you reform your body and your mind so that it's filled with a sustenance that and not broken apart. So you have to repair the structure. That's the tikkun of your own inner being. That rebuilding of the well is that restructuring of one's nature, restructuring of one's consciousness, right? Or from the parable we saw, to regenerate this yearning to be connected to the source of all life, right? And then all of these, these broken things uh, fall away. Then he goes on to say, towards the end, to realize, there's nothing beside God. That text, we already saw that text. And there's nothing beside God. And then by means of emuna, we would say, not just faith, but this longing of desire to be connected to God, yishtokeklo, will overcome one. So again, he has this issue of spiritual yearning, spiritual eros. Yitavel echoz lo bashem. That one will desire to seize and to attach oneself to God. Right? So notice now there's an interesting pun from that text we saw from the Ben Porat Yosef. One should, yochai, one should be to attach oneself. So davuk, and it's also le'echoz, to grab onto. And remember, the delusion was called achizat inayim, right? This, this illusion of things. You're attached to the wrong things. Your mind is fixed on the wrong things. So that this language that we call your mind being fixed, the attachment of consciousness, or what we call mindfulness, right? And then, then you're... There's this flow. And then he, and I'll just end with one very interesting thing. So he says, why does it mean, what is the link between this flowing, which is called a nachal? He says, if you're attached to God, then there's this flowing down, which is a nachal, which is a stream, right? 
which is the stream of godly energy. And then he does another trick of Hasidic hermeneutics. He takes the first letter of the Hebrew Nachal, Nun, Chet, and Lamed, come together as Nachal, but separately they form the first letters of a spiritual mantra, namely, Nafshi Chikta Lashem, from Isaiah 33, my soul desires God. So now you can see what the spiritual feedback loop is, right? There has to be an awareness of brokenness, however that happens, or a blockage. And then there has to be a desire, and that desire is gets involved in a spiritual rectification, this tikkun. It fixes, con it changes consciousness, right? It's that flow that now flows through one's own nourish sense, which is the structure of tradition, right? So what you're rebuilding are the vessels. The so at one level, it's the vessels. At one level, it's the self. And then we said that one of the revolutions of Hasidism is that it's a revolution of hermeneutics, right? So what I've been doing is to say that every word and letter is a vessel. How do you clean every word and every vessel so that you can pour or draw spiritual waters from it, which are already there from primordial times, according to this uh, particular teaching? So here you see, and with this we'll close, we'll take a few minutes of break, the complex dialectic that Green was bringing out in his own way, which I'm trying to stress from another angle. This balance between the conserving, powerful, structuring forces of tradition and finding within that new spiritual awakening resources, flow, potential to clean out your being, to clean out your mind, to clean out your thought, to clean out your desire, right? So where is that flow coming from? Well, if the world is the well, that's one thing. If the self is the well, that's another thing. If the religious community is the well, what are you repairing first? Or one's mind, or one's body, right? Or is it the religious practice that is, has become rote and now has to be filled with a spiritual flow? So he's not negating the tradition. Those are the wells. However, we see them, words, speech, action, performance of the commandments, the Sabbath, any day of the week, Monday, right? But you have to, and then you, with the, that process, you can be immediately attached to that devekut. Now, not everyone would say that you become part of God. That's a more radical spiritualist notion. But you can become part of the gift of life that God is giving. That's the God is the living God, right? And that that becomes a primary spiritual imperative. To say there's nothing but God is to say that God is the source of all life. So the primary imperative is to protect that and sustain it and to guard it. And so the Hasidim would say that everything one is doing is to support that life force and not to distort it or mess it up. So, um, anybody have any questions just on the text? Um, I'm, I'm trying to stay close to it so you can feel um, its grain. So let's, let's spend five minutes and then I think we'll take um, 10 or 15 minutes for a break and then we'll go on for that another hour and a quarter with Yes, Sam. Very practical question. Um, for except for the most recent portion you read, uh, were the was the green you're talking about speaking Torah or something else? Yeah, you, I was. Uh, well, the first ones I was speaking of is the essay on um, what is he called? The essay uh, "Discovery and Retreat." Yeah, that wasn't for me, at least, not on Canvas. I'm not sure if others had it. Did Did, did you not get that? Not, I did not personally. It was not on Canvas. I didn't get it. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, okay. 
uh, I will um, I will I will um, right after class. I'm very sorry. Okay, but I think uh, the class. I'm sorry. I thought that I that had been sent to Tzvi and that it was up on camera. So you go back and you'll reread it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I guess uh, I had the impression from Joel had referred to. I guess you had read it through some other channel. Uh, it originally was published in a book. I was part of, with Green. This was many many years ago in the '70s. Uh, the Other Side of God, that was edited by Peter Berger. That's where the essay first appeared. Um, but I will, um, as soon as we get off, I will send it to Tzvi, which will be midnight or somewhere late in, in Israel, so you'll get it in the morning, okay? So I do, well, I'm very, very sorry. I wish someone had said that I would have. So you weren't able to look at any of these texts while I'm translating. Anyway, okay. All right. Uh, um, apologies, I really. All right. Yeah, uh, any other any other issues um, here? So what I so now what I want to do is um, I guess in your time is a little before six, so let's have about twelve minute break till ten after. Then I want to uh, be doing the Maor Enayim, uh, and they spend the last five minutes because uh, the, these days um, Tuesday particularly is Holocaust Memorial Day. I wanted to, I, I think I, I, I had Svi send you a section of the, uh, the, the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Piazeshna Rebbe, and I wanted to just do uh, one second so that you can see that the Hasidic world was alive um, and destroyed almost completely in the fires of the ghetto, uh, but we'll, um, I want to just do one teaching in memory uh, of that to the last five or six minutes. So let's take off, um, let's, let's come back in about 12, 13 minutes. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll go for about an hour uh, of that and then spend five or 10 minutes doing that, uh, this very powerful text of the, uh, the Warsaw Get, Get, Get a Rebbe. Okay, so do what you need to do and let's reassemble in about 12, 13 minutes, okay? Thank you. Professor, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, do you think there's a difference between, this Who's is Ellie, sorry. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the break because this is more maybe maybe more insider baseball. But I'm curious if you can differentiate. I mean, there is something to be differentiated between Ahuza, which is like a very active thing, and Vekut, which is a, a state that you can never break from. Like even the even the lowest soul still has some form of Vekut to a, a so, higher being. So, um, just the Hebrew is Vaaz al Emuna. Right by means uh -huh. of emuna, so, yeah. so he will desire the yitaves. Those go together as synonyms. Yeah. Right? And then lechos uh -huh. okay. So um, what he um, what he meant in this particular case is um, uh, he probably is thinking in Yiddish and has something like tsufasen. Uh, um, and yeah. <laughs> so he's. Uh, it, this is probably not to be related to the to the Hebrew, but probably the uh, the calc or the Hebrew, the, the Yiddish that's underlying all of this. Uh -huh. As I would guess that this that this is um, this see this seizing this clinging uh, this 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 grabbing this um, um, huh. what, one uh, fasenzich right something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that, Interesting. I would. I, I think. I think. Uh, so that a little bit of insider baseball, I think that this is probably a, the Yiddish under, underlying all that. Okay, so I'm going to just take off a couple of minutes too, and we'll come. Let's come back. Sure. All right, bye. Thank you. Yeah.
There you go. All right. So um, there is a Kindle edition that uh, uh, that Josh uh, was able to purchase. Um, so um, uh, if uh, if you didn't receive your edition, uh, please do that. Uh, uh, and this is is um, is anybody friends with Josh? Anybody know Josh? No. No, you know, okay, so I'm gonna have to figure out some way. Apparently the formatting is not the same, but I'm gonna have to see how we can work that out. No, I, think right. the, I think the page numbers were accurate. It's just that it would be nice to also have the titles of the passages to be sure that reading the right. All right, all right. So just read through a number of those things then when, cause it's gonna be hard for me to double check and then we'll zero in on some. All right, so uh, I just wanna make sure a couple of people are, uh, Marsha, you're here? Yes. Okay, and Matt, are you here? Just want to know if you're here. He, he disappeared. And Yusuf Kronstein, are you here? All right, he's not here. All right, so let us, um, let us turn to the text, okay? I'm back, thanks. All right, I want to, uh, so uh, I, a couple of, just a couple of words um, about, about this. And that is um, the uh, the Maor Enayim, uh, the light of the eyes, um, is um, written uh, is composed compiled from Menachem Nachum of Chernobyl. Um, sort of, he's one of the grandfathers of the Tursky and other dynasties um, that you may have heard about. Um, uh, so one of the, uh, or the Aptarav, uh, uh, so, so it's one of the famous dynasties. He was born in Volhynia in 1730, died apparently in Chernobyl in 1797. And the Maori Naim, which is the collection of his teachings, was published in 1788. So it's among the earliest books uh, of... Um, of the, uh, the Hasidic uh, library, okay? And um, his son uh, wrote a very important book, uh, it's called a Likutei Torah. His son was uh, Mordechai of Chernobyl, and he was among the founders of the of dynasties, all right? So what I want to do now is to begin to read with you this these opening sections um, and parse some of the uh, the content so that you can um, get a sense of um, the um, the concerns that are involved. Okay, so I just want to just make sure I have the amount of material of the greens. So I know how far he he was going. Um, so, okay, I just want to see where how far he gave the translation. So I'm going to be translating from the text and clarifying. So everybody has Green's translation, I hope, or the Hebrew, if you have the, uh, the trans that. So now what we're going to do um, is um, uh, I'm, I'm going to just begin to read. Uh, I'm going to translate it without reading the Hebrew, but I'm going to read, uh, sight reading from the Hebrew so you can feel this. Okay. So the word that begins um, the scripture is bereshit, right, at the beginning. The word bereshit in the Torah is called the beginning of his way. So he's punning on the word bereshit from bereshit. It's the beginning of God's way. In the beginning of God's way, he created the world. So then he goes on to say, and this means that the beginning of everything uh, was created by Torah. So what the Chernobyl Rebbe is now going to tell us a little bit more um, mystically than what we already know from rabbinic literature um, is that there was a cosmic Torah that preceded creation. But now he's going to, the, the true Torah is the Torah that's in the heavenly spheres. According to the Kabbalistic tradition, it's linked to Tiferet. Um, so, and that is part of the source of all life and all being. So Torah is part of the cosmic structure of being. 
Uh, let me just one second. Let me just see. Ellie is coming in. Okay. Okay. So the Torah, then the the written Torah, the Oraita, the Torah Shebechtav, the written Torah, is part of the deepest, the deep structure of all being. And in fact, the deep structure of all being is the divine name. So one of the aspects of Tiferet is the divine name. And the divine name is the deep algorithm of every letter in Torah. And every letter in Torah is structuring every dimension of world being. Right? The oral tradition comes through Malchut, which is much lower. But he's now indicating that the beginning of this world in all worlds um, that we can talk about is coming now um, channeled through Oraita Torah. So we're not talking, we're not, we're not simply talking about a cosmic Torah, we're talking about the deep structure of all existence, which will be identified with God's name. So it's a dimension of God as well. Um, and so everything was created by means of the Torah. So that's the meaning of the spiritual meaning of Bireshit. Through at the very beginning, everything was created. And then he says, and the power of the of the creator is in what is created. So this is a very old notion, but it's a it's a significant notion. That is to say that the cause remains alive in its effect so that God is never not connected to world being. God who creates the world through Torah, whatever God infuses, and what we see as the letter of the page is simply a reconfiguration of, of supernal energies that can be read and comprehended by us at this level. But this, this, this ultimate grammar of existence can go through numerous forms. And the grammar of existence that we speak is simply a very low level, but a very important one because it allows us to connect to this deepest esoteric level of Torah. But to say that the poel is in the nifal, that God as the creator is in the effect, is to say that it remains alive and vital through everything that was created. Therefore, he says, in everything and in all the worlds is the power of Torah. Okay? And also in each person. So the person is a kind of microcosm from this mystical point of view and is also a Torah. Right? The person would also be a Torah from this point of view. Therefore, it says um, uh, in, in, the, in, in scripture, uh, in the book of Numbers, this is the Torah of Torah Adam. This is the Torah of a person. Because the Torah is in Adam. The Torah is a person. So he, he's reading this in a very specific um, way, as if that's an apposition. In other words, originally the text says, this is the Torah a man or a person who does X. But he's reasoning, this is a Torah, it's a person. Right? So now we're seeing that there, one of the deep structures of all being is Torah. Another way of understanding the structure of all things is a kind of anthropos, a cosmic sense of the human, of the human being. That flow of energy is not just a verbal flow, but the way we understand the flow of life energy in the person. Professor? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I have a question about this. Um, I was reading it and that verse um, is way out of context. True. Just that is because not- he, because, he, because he's no longer reading it in a literal way. So literally it says in the Hebrew, it says, uh, this is the Torah, Adam ki amut, um, um, a person that dies in a tent, et cetera, et cetera, is dealing with a very specific issue. Yes. He, is, he is breaking, he, from a spiritual point of view, this is a much larger notion of spiritual linguistics, but he's allowing himself to take two words in isolation, and the Torah is the Adam. So in other words, they are the same. 
Okay. So, so this is this is it's 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 it's, it's, it's He's, this is part of his own spiritual tradition and his own innovation, okay? But this is a much older way of reading that text, right? Right. So okay. he's going to say now, the, the Torah is a person, as we'll, we will discuss later. He's going he's gonna to flesh this out. And the Torah and the Holy One, blessed be, are one. So God, Torah, and the person are one. God, Torah, and Israel are one. Right? These are simply different configurations of the same energy. Right? So the human being is in the image of God. They're one. Torah is in the image of God. Um, and the person is the image of Torah. Therefore, nimtza, in everything, there is the chiyut of the Holy One, blessed be. That life force that we've been talking about is in everything. It's radiating through all being, coming through the source of Torah. And that's why... It says um, uh, in uh, the book of Nehemiah, and you uh, sustain or enliven everything, right? So that becomes a kind of a, a theological um, uh, super, super statement. Now, here's the key issue. Now, this notion of this cosmic Torah, which is the deep structure of all life, same kibyachol, God contracted himself and Torah, which is the same, into, as it were, going down through all the gradations of existence. And he placed a portion of God above into material world. So this phrase that we talked about earlier, that you are part of God above, he's now saying, you have to kind of use your spiritual imagination but he's saying that the notion of tzimtzum or contraction means that however we understand that God being the all, the all of all being, and all that that implies, in the, in the flow from the highest cosmic principles, a kind of a Neoplatonic notion, as as spirituality takes on different forms and dimensions and content, it enters into the kinds of dimensions that we can talk about from our human point of view. And it, the Torah itself has an infinite number of structures, right down to everything that exists in the material world, whose point of vitality that gives it life from God is a, uh, a, a, a microstructure of Torah, right? So it's a kind of quantum theory where every, the most infinitesimal things are little Torahs, right? And that's the structure of all possibility, okay? Because he says, the Ikar Kavanah now the person, what does that mean? And here we have a whole, the whole, his whole Kabbalah, his whole Hasidic world in a nutshell. Everything has descended down into this lower realm. So it creates a great chain of being. The great chain of being is in an infinite series of Torah, Torah structures, as it were. At one level, at the cosmic level, there's nothing but, it's always nothing but it. But these are microstructures within in, in every level of uh, possible uh, level of existence. And, the, in, and what was God's intention, right? The kavana, God's intention, as it were, is that people at the lowest level will raise up the structures in the lower level to the higher level. So that the uh, benefit of the light will grow then from the darkness, okay? So he's using certain images. So in this cosmic flow, which comes from cosmic Torah, that descends through all being, and everything is Torah, and everything is in the structure of a person. These are just simply variations of archetypal structures. Every letter is a Torah. Every letter is a person. Every letter is a configuration of light, right? They're overlapping structures. But as these descend, well, you might say, from supernal realms to what then we'd say the, 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 the physical or the cosmos in the sense of 
uh, uh, physics or chemistry or uh, earthly being, they become um, more um, f filled with the content of matter or this worldliness. And now the task is to restore the light, which is the godliness in everything back to its source. Okay. Now here we have, we'll come back to, the, to, a, to a famous debate. Uh, and we talked when Eliot asked earlier about the debate of early Hasidism, we're dealing with an essential debate. So the question is as follows. What does it mean to restore the light back to God? Okay. So Sholem claimed, against Buber, for example, but Sholem claimed a very radical notion. That God as creator is the source of the flow of all being. Content and form until in some cases in the lower world, content um, and the darkness uh, and materiality is all that we tend to see. If your eyes are not spiritually illumined, all you see is darkness. And this task of the spiritual person is to locate the spiritual core of, divi of divinity, which is light. That's the metaphor, right? It's the symbol to locate the spiritual course of divinity in everything and to restore it to God who is all light, right? Right, if you think, if, if you can get your head around that, right? So light becomes world and darkness. The lowest level of earth is darkness, hell, demonic, which still has a dimension of light. But the task now is to find those sparks of light we're not going to talk about how they came to be, but the sparks of light are part of the creative flow. He sees this as a positive, not as a result of a cosmic crisis, but it's a positive. And the individual, you and I, have the task of finding the spiritual core in everything and linking it back to God. Now, according to Sholem, a person who does that is performing an what we call an acosmic act, acosmism. That is to say, he's restoring everything back to God, which means that the world wouldn't exist. It's a nullification of the world. And Sholem claimed that that seems to be one of the goals of the mystic is to annihilate the world. To restore it back to God would mean that the world would no longer have its sources of vitality, which are God, the light. According to others, according to others, this is a form of attaching the light below to the light above. And it doesn't mean that the world ceases to exist because there is nothing but God. And once you pull the, pull the plug of light, things just fizzle and there's nothing there. The light goes out. And there's nothing there, it's just darkness because there is no existence. But he's saying that the task, other people would say, no, the task is to link the light below to the light, light above. In other words, to restore it back, to, to, to be conscious of its source. Okay, and that's a very different notion, obviously. And different schools of Hasidism could take a different stand on this, on this spectrum. It's a very complicated issue. Now, what the Chernobler is going to do is something very important for Hasidut. So let, let me take a step backward. There is a key notion in Hasidism, which we, we call the descent for the sake of elevation. Yurida Sorech Aliyah. Descent for the sake of elevation. So from the cosmic point of view, God descends throughout all the worlds, through all of existences, through Torah existences, so that the world and everything could exist. And the spiritual task is to raise the sparks back to God. 
Okay, that's the Neoplatonic cycle. It goes down, descensus and ascensus. That's a Neoplatonic way of describing that cycle of light, that cycle of existence. Okay. Now, with that as a mental background, the, Chino, the Chernobler and many Hasidic rabbis would say that the spiritual leader, a tzaddik, to be, or let us say each one of us in a different way, but to be a spiritually um, completed person, right? To be, uh, to, be a, a, to be a fully integrated spiritual person means that you just can't be flying off in the spiritual realm. You have to know that, th that, that God's, God created the material realm as well. And in the material realm, things can go south, right? Viruses can breed pandemics, right? Things can go south. They can go south by people. They can go south by, um, by all kinds of ecological errors. They can go, all, go south by error. They can go, the life force of breeding can misbreed, okay? Things can go south. And they can also go south because you and I have negative instincts and urges. We're people, right? Uh, we can hate, we can speak, we can misuse our passions, we can misuse our bodies, we can misuse our minds. That's where that negative of the physicality uh, can be misappropriated or put to the service of demonic forces, okay? And part of that is where evil begins to re re rear its ugly head. Evil globs on to these spiritual forces and distorts them. It's not two things, good and evil, but the negativity globs on and misdirects the power, the, the, the positive, which is the life force, okay, right? You know, bats are a life force, breeding, breeding insects are a life force, but uh, they, can, they can be a misbreeding. And then it can spread and, and be horror from, a, from this point of view, okay? So now what he's saying is the major characters in scripture, Joseph, Moses, any, any of the characters exemplify, what is the Torah really talking about? It's talking about events in, in their spiritual biography. It's not simply talking about their historical life. It's talking about events in spiritual or psychic, psychic life, which means that they are archetypes of our own inner structure. Okay, which means you and I to become integrated persons means that we have to come to terms with our negative energies and transform them to the good or integrate them. If not, they split off and they become a negative force on their own, the other side. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about Darth Vader, I'm talking about the Sitra Achra, the other side, which is simply all of these energies uh, that take on a negative life of their own, right? Okay, that's the other side. That's, um, that's the evil force, all right? The force be with you. You have to deal with the, negative, the evil force. Okay, so we all have to make friends with Princess Leia and Artudito and they're all part of your psychic structure. And what you have to do then is to risk the dangers of integration. Right? If you're not in a situation where you have to come to terms with your negativities or your potential 
you live in a fairyland and you're not an integrated self. So the integral self, the tzaddik, the true tzaddik or the chassid, is able to descend, that is to say, to encounter the things in a lower level of consciousness or reality. And through that integration to raise it up to a more positive form. That's restoring it to God, right? Restoring it towards something of light rather than shadow. Everybody with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now he's going to talk about Joseph. He's going to be the first person that we're going to talk about because Joseph has to go down to Egypt. Right? And one of the things that happens when Joseph goes down to Egypt is he's going, there's going to be a potential seduction by the wife of Potiphar. Right? In the, that's in the biblical text. Nothing that he does, he has to try to resist it. He's called the tzaddik because he does. But he goes into a situation that Egypt is sort of the symbol of hypersexuality. Now, it's, it's, the, it's the scene of, of um, unstructured desire. Okay? However we want to discuss that. Pure id. Okay? So, the person has to go there and come to terms with that before they can be a teacher and leader. If they don't do that, they're not living, they, they can't be a leader because they haven't come in contact with the negative and the evil. Right? So they're going to be teachers for us because they are archetypes of what we have in ourselves at the deepest level of our being. A tzaddik can do that, but there are cases where a tzaddik goes down and um, gets gets pulled to the other side, right? Or a person could get pulled to the other side because their inner strength is not sufficient to create the right kind of integration, right? So that's, that's, that's what's going on here. But God is the model who does this, but God doesn't, God descends, but God needs the human being to raise up the negative. So everybody now has to be imitatio dei to descend into another realm, to another state of consciousness, to another situation of desire, and to withstand it and integrate it. And then you can become a teacher and a leader. Otherwise, you're just splitting, and a split person may have some very nice spiritual qualities, but they haven't come to terms with their negative. Okay? So, so now, yeah, yeah, who's talking? Uh, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. Is this, descent, uh, is this descent inevitable or obligatory? Uh, uh, both, both. So um, it's, it's inherent in, it's inherent in the fact of the world that we live in, um, so that every person should be, could be doing this at every single moment. Every single moment of an encounter is a decision of how you're gonna use that thing in the world, right? It's not, we're, not, we're not talking about, you have to go down into Egypt, into, into self-bondage or whatever, right? Everything you deal with is moving from your inner world down into something else, into something else, right? It is. It can be a choice where the tzaddik um, wants to um, rescue or heal their followers. Let's say, from the Hasidic point of view, um, secularity was a great danger to tradition, right? So some of the teachers begin to learn secular subjects, so they go and meet atheists. Rabbi Nachman is a famous case of that. 
And the question is, can they withstand it? Can they use, in other words, what they're trying to do is spiritual jujitsu, right? You use their negative language to flip them to the good side, right? Right, you're using their energy. And it's all spiritual jujitsu. That's really what's going on here, right? But some people don't know how to use the negative energy to flip it. So they could fall into chaos. So some, some masters um, get messed up. Um, some don't, right? Like, so like all the swamis that came, my day in the, coming to Cambridge in the 60s, um, and then they got trapped not in materiality and sexuality and a thousand a harem, and they lost their way, right? They're car salesmen today. So there was a, huh? what? They're car salesmen today, right? Yeah, right, right. So this was, so this, this, uh, this was one of the funny things that happened in, during the, uh, the so-called revolution of the 60s. But it, uh, but it happens in different ways at all of the times, right? Right, right. The spiritual rock star that then becomes, everybody wants to sleep with a spiritual rock star. So the spiritual rock star gets messed up. Okay, all right. So let's go now back to this, the text we were at. So this is the issue of the descent of Joseph to Egypt, right? It's an archetype, it's a structure. It's a structure of consciousness. So he goes down to the slowest levels and plays on the word Nitzrayim, which is Egypt, to the most, contract, the most contracted levels, the Meitzariya, the most contracted levels. Notice it's not only the symptom that, of the contraction that brings us to this world, but it's the contractions of the contractions. Okay? Really down there. Um, now, even down there, there are potentials of light, but he ha it has to be dealt with, right? And that's why his name is called Joseph, Yosef. He's called Joseph because Yosef means there is a tosafot. There are, he has extra capacities of light. He's a person of enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment. His name symbolizes this spiritual surplus. So he's going to go down to Egypt with a spiritual surplus, and actually it'll save him because he will not be seduced. But he'll be tempted. And there's a great seduction scene that the scripture plays out. Okay? So, that's, so he, he symbolizes having this. Some people, some people have a little bit more light than others. So they're a, they have a Joseph structure in their brain. They're a Joseph archetype. They have a little bit more. Some people have less, and some people have more. So a Joseph structure has more, okay? So that is, so that, so it says, that's why Jacob, his father, um, so Jacob saw, so, okay, Jacob saw that there was Shever, so Jacob saw that there was uh, um, that there was that there was a um, there was a drought, right? And he had to go down to Egypt. So he's playing off the biblical text. But now the spiritual master says, "What did Jacob really see? Who's the father of Joseph? He saw that there was shivira. There was brokenness in the world. Everything was fragmented, right?" The structures of light, the the the, um, the cisterns were all shattered. They were scattered, and that is understood as the novlot chachma. So, which means that wisdom had been had descended and was distorted. So, when we're talking about the fragmentation of things, we're talking about the distortion of, of knowledge, distortion of understanding, the distortion of realities, right? So wisdom has this cosmic dimension and it can be the source of distortion and brokenness, right? 
And he saw that it had come down from this extraordinarily high place into an Egypt, there was this fragmentation, okay? And everything that comes down from this higher level comes down through different dimensions of fragmentation, okay? So before, at, the, at the ultimate beginning, everything has this unity. But one of the features of when things begin to enter the world, they enter into the subject-object consciousness of our life. So that's the fragmentation of wisdom. Now, that fragmentation can be reused and healed or it can be a source of brokenness, right? So just think, you're looking at the words on a page, right? So if you pulled all the letters apart, you pulled the words apart, you just have fragmentation of wisdom. Put it together into a spiritual meaningful sentence, you might have some, something towards wholeness, right? So he's going down to Egypt because Jacob saw, he saw this. So he's going to be like a tzaddik and he is going to descend into Egypt, right? He's going to descend into Egypt because he saw this and that it was necessary to go down there. Lehit barer ul'alot. He had to purify the brokenness and the fragmentation and all, in other words, spiritual thoughts can be filled with barnacles and crusted over, they become rusted by misuse, right? So you've got to do a little bit of spiritual draino and take a Brillo pad to your spiritual thoughts. And, and that's what he's talking about, lehit barir. It's a very old notion, but it means to purify. But you have to clarify it. You have to be able to use it in a certain kind of a spiritual way and to raise it up. And therefore, they went down there for a period, he plays on a number of terms to go down there uh, for a period of time, 214 um, uh, uh, years, uh, uh, 10 years, and that is going down uh, into that place. And to bring the chiyut, vitality, into that place. So what we see is a historical movement that looks like an attempt to kind of um, go and to find the shever in Mitzrayim, whatever kind of produce that could be. He really sees it from the negative side that there is a fragmentation. And the descent is because Jacob has a spiritual understanding about things. It's not that there is produce there that he has to leave but he descends out from the land of Israel and he descends to Egypt because he sees there a produce, but the produce is now inverted as Shavira, right? And because he has a spiritual eye, he sees what we know most of us don't see. And he goes down there as an act of purification. So the whole period of time, the 210 years in Egypt is a period of purification, okay? So he wants to bring this chiyut. And that's what the text means when it says that Joseph died. Because everything, because now the play on Joseph's name is not the yud of Yosef of increase, but it, everything came to the sof, to the end. That's another play on his name that Joseph now represents the, the, the lowest level in which things can descend. And the Torah descends all these levels. And when Torah gets to the bottom level, where what we talked about, that the life force is no longer energized, it's called death. That's what he says. It's called death. Because it goes down to the slowest level, and it dies. Now, here we, you can, now again, we can see the genius of the hermeneutical move. So it says, what happened when Joseph died in Egypt? It says, so it says they embalmed him in Egypt, right? That's what it literally means. Joseph was embalmed in Egypt. But it's said that he died. But remember, another part of his name is increase. So now this, the Maori um, Naim, in a brilliant move, reads 
that same verb, which means to embalm, as if it also says lachnot, which means to sprout. So now, that you see, we're, now we're being brought into the paradoxicality of mystical thinking, right? Just as we saw that the wells that contain negativity can be cleaned and repaired, the bottommost place of death is the place of rebirth. The very thing of the embalming of death can have a place to sprout with and can go back up again. Right? There's no final point. There's this cycle of birth and rebirth, of descent and ascent. And it's the perception that in this most negative place is a seed of possibility. That's what he's saying, right? Right? In the coffin, there's a seed of possibility. That which can that which covers over the soul is now also becomes a tree of life, he says. It's the tree of life. The same thing as the tree of death is the tree of life. It was carved into a tree of death as a coffin, but it can be a tree of life. And a tree follows its sprouting, he says. You know, he's talking in Aramaic a little bit. Um, so even though Joseph went to the end, so playing on his name, to the end, he, there was a re-sprouting from Joseph. And he was placed in the Aron, placed in the ark. And then he says something quite remarkable. Now notice that the, the chain of association could look a little bit off the wall, but we're also we're getting it in a kind of more fragmentary form. But I want you to help to see the chain of associations. So he, he begins, look, look what he says. So he just says that he was placed in the coffin, okay? And one of the words for a coffin in Hebrew is aron. The word aron can also stand for the holy ark. Right? The very word itself can be used for a coffin or a holy ark. The same way that you, the embalming word can be the word of the tree of life. Right? Everybody with me? Yeah. So now he makes this amazing move that only a spiritual master could associate to, because we don't think like that. So once he makes the move that the, the death which is life in the coffin, which is the Aron, in what sense can this be the place of renewal? So he moves to a rabbinic tradition um, in which, 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 uh, which, we, which we know uh, from the Talmud, in Brachot, which says that the tablets that Moses broke at Mount Sinai, the first tablets, Luchot um, and the Shivrei Luchot, Munachim Hayu Ba'aron. So the, the rabbis had a tradition, and I'll, now we're going to see what the spiritual aspect is. The rabbis had a tradition that the broken tablets, the first tablets, because of sin were broken, and the second tablets were placed together in the portable ark that led the people through the desert and the wasteland. But just, just absorb with this. Just absorb what he's saying. So we just said that Joseph is in a coffin, which is a tree of life, right? Now he's also saying that the tablets which were broken because of idolatry, that is to say because of broken consciousness, broken spirituality, the, tab the broken tablets represent a broken mind, a broken spirit, broken religiosity, right? they were placed together with the second ones. They go together. Negative plus, plus minus. Negativity, positivity. Death, life, ruin, rebirth. Right? The symbol of idolatry, the symbol of covenantal life. So that 
even the the types of wisdom that fell down um, could now have a place and be reborn. So the uh, the broken tablets represent the far the fallen wisdom, and the fallen wisdom can then be carried into the land and become a new teaching. So notice now, can you can see the way he's progressing image by image, and we're moving from a cosmic theology to a whole psychology of consciousness, and a whole moral psychology, and a positivity that doesn't deny the negative and the dark side, the, 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 right? The two sides of the moon are two sides of the moon, right? But it's one moon. Everybody, you see, you see now, we're beginning to get into the paradoxicality. So this is not just thinking back about we said how we began the class, right? About the transvaluation of values that's connected also with the reinterpretation and the ways of becoming a new person. And what a teacher like Menachem Nachum of, of the Light of the Eyes is doing. He's guiding you through scripture so that you can understand your own cycle of consciousness. So that you can understand that dissent is for the sake of ascent. That negativity is the seed of, of rebirth. So he's speaking as a monotheist. Everything is one. Everything is whole. Right? Right? But you can carry this light and go around the globe and you can shine it in one place and forget it. And then there's dark side in the other, but it's all one. Right? And part of this issue is to realize this and that this is not simply something that's self-standing. It's something that's affected by consciousness. Right? It's another aspect that's affected. It's the paradoxicality of consciousness and awareness. So let me just um, make a couple of points more about this. Maybe we can come back to this next time. But I want to just continue on because you can see it's rich, but you have to learn how to read it. And then you have to see how it opens up with this spiritual wisdom. So now he says, let's now go back to the point I was making a little bit earlier in my sermon, namely that the Torah makes everything alive. You can see already how he's still connected to all of these, these things, right? Because everything is from God. So God is the source of all life. And you can kill it, but you can't kill it, right? right? In other words, you, you smother it, but you can't, you can't put it out. So now he says, now he's going to, Take it one more psychological step and then we'll stop for this. We'll do this, uh, the final thing. So he says, you, because God is the source of everything and God is the enlivening force of all things, behold, davar, or the Torah, he's the mechaye hadavar. God is the source that enlivens everything. That is the, should be the focus of consciousness. That's what it means to break through the palace, to have that consciousness. You should not, now here, this is, keep that parable in the back of your mind, right? So that means you should not be looking at the external physicality of everything. If you only look at the physicality of that, you're on the outside of the palace. You're not focusing on what gives it spiritual sustenance, right? You're only on the outside. But if you are able to see that it's spiritually enlivened from the inside, but you should look at panimiyuta, the panimiyuta deva, the inwardness, the interiority. Now, we're not talking about a magic box, right? Oh, you... Maybe you're talking about a magic box. 
But we're not talking about that. Uh, now we have this uh, magic Rubik's cube or something like that. Like, okay, and you can then you find you find the pearl inside, right? You know, it's not, to talk about the inwardness of this is a much more subtle psychological spiritual thing. You're talking about its inner capacity of possibilities. That's the inwardness of it, right? Not just its outer form, but what makes it tick, right? What makes it go. So if you're looking in a relationship that can be the outer gashmi side, that doesn't mean just that their body, but it means like um, that's the outer face of things. But what is the inner pulse? That's the inwardness, right? So we're not, we're not, we're talking a much more complex way than talking about, you know, uh, you know, can you, can you, can you find, can you find the pearl in the dung heap? That's, you can talk that way, but that's a very silly way to talk. Okay. So he's a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, so now he says, you should look at the inwardness of things. And that is the mystery of what we have uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, when it says that the wise person has his eyes in his head, but a fool walks in darkness. So what's the spiritual meaning of that? And how does this relate to what we're talking about? When it says, so a wise person is wide awake and has his eyes in his head, and a fool is blind and walks in darkness. Okay, so that's, that's obviously what the simple level of the parable is. But that's not what he's concerned about. He's going to play on the Hebrew. The Chacham who has a Nav Birosho is not just a guy who's, got, who's wide awake with his eyes open, but has his inner eye on the Rosh, on the supreme on the supreme issues to be focused on. What is one's rosho? What is above one? What is one's supreme, what is the supreme truth? What is the supreme reality? What is the supreme possibility? So a wise person has their spiritual eye on the source of things, right? The whole verse is totally flipped. It's a spiritual, it's, advi it's spiritual advice. It's not just telling you what any Tom, Dick, and Harry or Mary and Louise would know that a person, some people, a wise person is wide awake and a, and a dumb person trips all over themselves. But now it's where your mind is focused. Rosho is on God or the higher principles or the top of the spiritual hierarchy, right? That you want to bring things up to. Right? So that's, that's why it says, and the Zohar, he says, divanash. So where's a person's eye taking him? Where, where, where is it going? You can tell a person by, the, by not just their outer eye, but their inner eye, not their third eye. Right? The orbital frontal cortex, right? With their inner eye. Where is it going? So he says, quoting the Zohar, Chakima mistakel man dekaima al reshe. So a wise person is focused on what exists above, on the true source of things. That is to say, he says, he looks at, he, she looks at everything at the reshit. Now, your mind should already be triggering you back to the beginning of this whole sermon. The reshit at the beginning. Your mind should be going back to the source of all things. Right? The rosh. Right? Because in his spiritual imagination, you see how it's like a Moebius strip and how these terms keep popping up now in new ways. Rosho is related to his head or the beginning or God is linked to bireshit. Everything comes from that source, from that rosh. You see, you see what, this is this issue of this transvaluation of language, of how language is serving spiritual consciousness. 
So his eyes is there. Me ayin or me ayin. Nishtal shala. Where, where is everything descending from? What is the chain of being? How do you put that into your head? And what is its source? Who is its source of this thing? So that means when you're looking at a friend, you don't look at the outside, but the inside. What is the source of that giving light? What is that, where, where is that coming from? Where is, that, where is your spiritual consciousness directed when you're looking at the life form that's coming to expression through another person? So now he's coming back to what I had hinted at. So, I, so I, my head ran away ahead of him, but I, we, we both came to the same place. And that's what it means, Bereshit Bara. At the beginning, God created. With the Torah, God created the heaven and the earth, which is the source of things, which is Klalut HaKol, which is the totality of all things, the Choldavar, and everything in them. Right? So then he says, that's what the little word et means. It says, God created shema, et HaShemayim et HaAretz. That little word et, which means nothing, except introduces the direct object, actually refers to the totality of being that connects everything. All the connecting tissue. That's the connecting tissue of consciousness. But if you don't look at the source and the principle, all you look at is the tohu vavohu, the chaos. So the whole beginning of the text is telling us to look at the source of heaven and earth. And if you don't look at the source, all that you're going to see is chaos. In other words, you're not going to see anything in orderly spiritual potential. Your eye doesn't have a hermeneutical focus. And then he goes on. So maybe what we can... Maybe we'll pick up with this. Um, people want to continue with this next week too, Will uh, this text? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's, we'll continue with this. But what I did want to do was um, make a few comments about the uh, Pia Zechner. So let's make a little bit of a mental <coughs> transition. Professor, can I ask a quick question? What? Can I have a quick question? On this, what we just did? Yeah. Yeah. Does the action of man in increasing his self-awareness affect the heavenly uh, abode as well? Um, yes and no, right? Uh, it, it's, um, it allows that flow, you, you take the blocks out of it, right? You, repairing it means allow them to have their own structure, right? Because there's an infinite number of ways in which these things can be distorted. And each person creates a distortion in reality. So the ultimate end of things is when all these distortions have been healed. Is that distortion reflected in the heavenly abode as well? Uh, I mean, it, 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 it depends on who's, who we're talking about, but it's, uh, it depends on what, it, it's, um, Hasidim is mostly focusing on the way we block things. Okay, so when I, I want to, I don't want to get into the more kabbalistic aspect. All right. So what I want to do is, um, I think I hope you all got that text uh, from the Piazetchner and uh, part of the text, which is it's a very beautiful book done by a friend of mine, Ora. Whiskey and Elper called Hasidic Commentary on the Torah. And um, so she has a discussion of this towards the end in a translation. Um, um, so I just want to, because um, you know, we're coming up to the Holocaust Memorial Day, um, uh, I wanted to just do a teaching from um, the so called Rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, he actually is a descendant um, of one of the second and third generations around the of the uh, around the Magid. Um, 
Colon, uh, this his name was Colonimus Kalman Shapira. Uh, he was a, a rabbi in Piazeczno, which is outside of Warsaw in Poland. And he eventually stayed with his congregation in the Warsaw ghetto and maintained the tradition <clears throat> um, as carefully as he could. Um, but suffered, in addition, enormous tragedy. He saw all five of his sons and wife murdered in front of his eyes and continued to teach um, and support the community in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, the, the text of a, one of the, the texts that survived from him, which was uh, buried, and some of it was mailed to a relative in Tel Aviv, which is then found, is called the Holy Fire, Eish Kodesh. And it's a series of his teachings. We have his other, some of his other Sabbath teachings, but these are teachings into the darkest times. And the teaching that we're gonna look at now is from 1942. Um, so we're dealing with a period of enormous horror in the Warsaw Ghetto um, and the degradation and death and suffering. Um, and he represents one of the Kedoshim. So he is one of the, the holy ones um, who maintained spiritual integrity, even in this text where he reflects spiritual doubt and pain um, and prays for the uh, mercy of God. These other texts where he talks about the divine tears, uh, but in this particular text, and, he, and he'll do it in, uh, in a way that um, only a, a Hasidic master could do. Now there's, there's no denying the reality, but there's an attempt to raise it, raise it to a level of spiritual possibility, right? That's all that one can do under these circumstances. So I just want to kind of go through a couple of parts of this. Maybe I'll just talk about it a little bit, maybe quote a couple of things I gave you as a small section. So Dominic, he, he gives these teachings in the ghetto, um, Often they would be in the third Sabbath meal, late Saturday afternoon, um, where people would gather as a spiritual community. Um, and then he would give something about um, the text. And it's interesting that in this particular uh, text, it's talking about how God appeared to Abraham and talks about the fact um, about uh, that, um, how he will take them out of Egypt and will see the sufferings of the people in Egypt. And it's uh, allusions to these issues that God hadn't seen, but then God attends to the sufferings uh, of Egypt. Now what's also powerful here is how he develops his sermon. So he begins the sermon um, by talking about the ashes that remain from the Holocaust offering. That's the Ola, which was the whole burnt offering. And other kind, or the Chatat, which is the sin offering. And they produce Deshen, they produce ashes. And there's a whole aspect in rabbinic literature of Terumat Hadeshen, in which the ashes are raised up and dealt with in a certain way. But as a Hasidic Rebbe, he's now, we have been talking about raising things up before, he's now going to talk about elevating the ashes. Because he has very much in mind the deaths that he saw and the death of his children that he alludes to. So it's not just raising them up onto the altar or dealing with them in a certain way, the true matadesh in this particular offering, 
but it's raising them up to a new level of spiritual hope and possibility. And, as, and before we get to, to that particular aspect, he again alludes to a very interesting aspect in the Talmudic text, or from the biblical text, that the utensil that was used in the temple to, like a dustbin, to gather up the deshen, the ashes from the offerings, was called a magrefa, kind of a scraper, right? And according to the rabbinic tradition, that as the scraping went on, it produced this melodious sound, the sound of song, um, the sound of singing and joy as it's gathering up the ashes. And of course, he will go on to say that just as the sacrifice of Isaac didn't take place, but there was an animal that substitute, every offering is a substitute for the sins of the person and their, um, the ashes of the animal become the ashes of their materiality that now has been um, purified so their soul could go up. And the song of the scraping accompanies that ascending of the soul that's symbolized in the temple service. So then the Piazetchner Piaz uh, goes on to say that um, sometimes we don't fully appreciate the deaths of people or the sacrifice, he's alluding to his um, children, um, but when they ascend, they have the capacity to um, beseech mercy from the silent God that God who doesn't appear to be turning the face of compassion may respond to um, the souls who suffered. Okay. And he alludes to the fact of his sons that he prays will become intercessors in heaven so that the silent God will express mercy towards the suffering in the ghetto. And only those who've read the accounts uh, can uh, begin to understand what he saw on a daily basis. The, the spiritual and the human, not just the death, but the degradation of what it means to be a person. Okay. So then he goes on to say that under the best of circumstances, um, people try to transform this negativity into something higher. That's the trumat tradition, raising it up. But there is the capacity of evil that can destroy even the spiritual seeker. And that is the quality of Amalek. Amalek becomes the symbol uh, of degradation and death, but it can create this impassive coldness in one's heart that one can no longer respond to spiritual life with a kind of inner vitality, he's saying. In other words, it's it's where, it's the point where silence seeps in and it chills the heart. He's using these images. And it chills the heart to such a degree that one can't, um, one, one loses one's spiritual way. Now, he, he, he says these things in a very, very circumspect um, in a very um, 
um, delicate way, but it's quite clear that he talks about atzlut and kvedut and krirut. That's just a kind of a deadening and a weightiness that comes down over the soul. And it's, it's hefech emuna. It flips one's spiritual consciousness so that it has a tendency to die and it becomes pagum, becomes sullied, becomes impure. Um, so then the sacrifices of all the kadoshim, of all those who have gone up, we can only pray that they will ascend. And he says, now what one has to concentrate on is, so he, he, um, so he, he, he quotes a variety of Talmudic texts which deal with desolation and loneliness and prayer within um, the rubble. And he quotes a, um, often when a person dies in rabbinic Judaism, one of the phrases is chaval al da'avdin. There's a sorrow for those who've been lost, but they're not forgotten. They, rem they remain. And then in this act of spiritual courage, he says, you have to take the da'avdin, that which you have lost in yourself, the spiritual brokenness that has happened because of this onslaught of evil, this onslaught um, against one's inner spiritual life. And you have to take the da'avdin, that's what you've lost. You take, that is that you take your, the pain of your brokenness um, and you have to make that into this magrifa, this gathering up of the ashes of what has been broken and lost and turn that into an elevated song of spiritual possibility. Okay. So that's what he says in the end, he says, you take, it's by raising up that what it is, the wobegon, the loss, the woe. You take the wail and the lament, and then you raise that up. Um, th th you, you take the pain of the loss of faith or the loss of answer or the silence, and that's what you raise up. And you raise that up in the acknowledgement that maybe this will arouse divine mercy and turn because you're raising it up in the, the woe that you're raising is the woe of the loss of those who died, right? And that that's being now raised in consciousness and um, then the text breaks off. So only, only a great spiritual saint can talk this way and comfort a community this way. And here we see um, the power of Hasidic um, thinking at the abyss, um, which doesn't deny the abyss but tries to give it a, a um, spiritual rectitude um, through the through spiritual courage. So um, I offer, I give you this uh, so that you can remember the great columnist Kalman Shapiro, the Rebbe of Piazetchno, um, and all those spiritual saints um, who are able 
to raise up silence into song. Okay? So keep that in mind in the next few days um, as we remember, as we remember uh, the struggle to triumph over, over sorrow. Okay. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much.